We are starting to wrap up uh, uh, this hearing, uh, and I want to thank the witnesses uh, again for your testimony. But I have a couple of quick questions, and I know uh, Chairwoman Klobuchar has a couple, and then we'll have some uh, closing uh, comments. My, um, I guess I'll, I'll start with the, the, these two questions in the preface. I'm going to st uh, start these questions where I started my questions uh, initially uh, with the events that happened uh, in the summer of 2020, where authorization happened very quickly uh, for the National Guard. There was no delay. Uh, there, you were immediately uh, deployed, uh, General Walker, uh, and yet uh, it happened differently uh, prior to uh, Jan or on January 6th. And part of that is some of the surveillance. So my first question for you, uh, uh, Ms. Sanborn, it's been reported that the FBI deployed its state-of-the-art surveillance plane to watch uh, the protests that occurred in Washington, D.C. over the summer in response to the death of uh, George Floyd. How do you explain the difference in how the FBI responded to the Black Lives Matter protest compared to the pro-Trump protest? So I don't have any specifics on the plane. It's just not my purview of something that I cover specifically as the Assistant Director of Counterterrorism. But what I can tell you from the Counterterrorism Division's approach to both of those was not different. We go after the violence, and what we saw all summer long was violence and people using the guise of First Amendment protected activity to conduct violence. And we opened hundreds of cases and arrested close to 100 people throughout the summer and their activities. So our approach to both instances was equal opportunity. If you're going to do violence, in the United States and break federal law, the FBI is going to investigate. Well, certainly, and I understand that, and you should. Uh, there, there's no quarrel there. But where would we get the answer on the use of a surveillance plane versus not on January 6th, but on other occasions across the country? Yeah, I'll take the question back. I think it would be best posed for our um, critical incident response group, but definitely I'll find somebody that can follow up with you. I, I appreciate that. General Walker, you were also asked uh, by, by someone on the panel about uh, the helicopter and uh, with, in relation to January 6th, and you said that's not normally something we would, uh, we would use, and I, I, I believe, I don't want to mischaracterize, you said it wouldn't be necessary, but uh, that's, what I did get from it is that uh, it's not normally used, and yet it was used uh, in the summer protest. Why was it used there and not on January 6th? What, was there a different of circumstances? How do we explain that difference? So it is my understanding, so one of my deputy commanding generals author, uh, put the helicopter up. Ultimately, it's still me. But the request was made to, to get, I believe the request was to be able to observe and report the crowd size. It, it was at night, that, that night, versus a daytime operation. And so that's why the helicopter was there. Uh, I just want to correct the record regarding the RC-26 that was mentioned the, the District of Columbia National Guard never requested an RC-26 fly over the uh, District of Columbia. So the difference between the summer and January 6 was the Secretary of the Army was right next to me for, you know, for days at a time. When, when it came time to respond to the, to the White House, the Secretary of the Army was with me. The monuments. The Secretary of the Army was with me. He either came to my headquarters, he rode in the car with me, or, or I rode in the car with him. I was present when he called the Secretary of Defense and the Attorney General to request uh, uh, approval for a request that the city made. So the, the city wanted us to conduct additional traffic control points, blocking vehicles. Uh, uh, the Secretary gave me a verbal and then contacted the Secretary of Defense and the Attorney General, and it was done. So, so those, those are just some of the differences that occurred. Um, and I didn't have the Secretary of the Army with me on January 6th. Well, the Secretary was with you during the summer. Those were large, large gatherings. All the evidence pointed that this was going to be a very large gathering, and we know that some, based on social media, that there would, the Capitol and members of Congress was going to be a target. Is there a reason? that you know of, that the Secretary of Army was unable to be with you on that day? I, I don't, but the Secretary of the Army is the Secretary of the entire Army, so I, I don't know what else was going on throughout the Army. We're globally deployed. I, I do not know why he was not with me on January 6th, as, as he was during the summer. Very good. Ms. Uh, Sanborn, uh, finally, uh, uh, and I'll wrap up here. Uh, Ms. Sanborn, could you please commit that in the future, 
uh, the FBI will provide any threat reporting, even if it's not yet corroborated or fully analyzed, relating to the security of the Capitol, uh, to the U.S. Capitol Police, both Sergeant of Arms and Congressional and uh, Committee leadership. I believe I can do that, sir. Yes. Great. Thank you. Very good. Um, thank you all. And I know it's been a long day, and you probably want some lunch. Um, and um, I really appreciate uh, your patience today. I wanted to end in some, with some ideas and constructive ideas, which is why we're doing this hearing um, and how we can best do that. And any of you can take this, but uh, this is just based on all of the experience you've had. We have a unique situation here at the Capitol where uh, the chief is reporting to this police review board. Um, you, um, General Walker, may be most familiar with it, but the, they're reporting to the uh, sergeant at arms, the two sergeants of arms, and the architect of the Capitol. It's three of them. And in fact, just today, uh, Senator Schumer announced a new sergeant at arms, uh, Karen Gibson, while you guys were sitting there. Um, and so there is something about the structure which may work for requesting resources or making decisions, but certainly uh, didn't work in this context where the uh, chief, the then chief son, was leading up to it, asking them, probably not able to do exactly what he may have wanted to do at the time. And then the most ridiculous of situations during the insurrection is actually calling them for their advice and authority while they are individually guarding the members and safely getting them to other places in this crisis situation. Um, and just your views on whether or not that is an ideal situation. This is called a softball, General Walker. That is a, uh, whether or not this is a uh, ideal situation and maybe um, Ms. Sanborn um, for trying to make decisions in a crisis as we look at changes that we can suggest and make here at the Capitol? So the, the Sergeant of Arms, both of them, were briefed by me personally in 2018 on what it takes to request District of Columbia National Guard support. Mm -hmm. I sat down with both Sergeant of Arms, myself and Brigadier General Dean and others in their office and explained the, the, the um, six-step process and left them with a PowerPoint presentation. I also briefed Chief Sun and his predecessor. I had them come to the armory and explain in detail what it takes if you ever need District of Columbia National Guard support. What I think might be helpful in the future is that that, that is practice, that you come up with an event Will we need District of Columbia National Guard support? You pick a day and say, and then we exercise it. Mm -hmm. And then have the District of Columbia National Guard actually come out in an exercise. Here's where we would go. Here's how we would support the United States Capitol Police. Mm -hmm. but, but both sergeants of arms understood what it takes to request District of Columbia National Guard support. Mm -hmm. Mr. Salis, do you want to add anything to that? Uh, thank you, Senator. Yes, I do. I, I, I work on a regular basis with the Capitol Police Board. I just met with the, the new team on Monday, in fact. Um, the, the challenge, quite candidly, is in, in contingency operations and contingency events, there really needs to be one person in charge making decisions. Mm -hmm. to, to have four people that have to either agree or come together and have the same. I just don't think it's a very workable solution. I also mm -hmm. deal with all the Capitol Police come, uh, requests that come to the Defense Department. Normally, we, have to, we get the request actually at the last minute most of the time, because it takes all four of them to sign the document to give us the request. For example, right now, we have the National Guard on the Capitol today. It's supposed to end on the 12th. I, we're trying to figure out, with the Capitol Police Board, what, what's going to happen after the 12th. We need an answer in the Defense Department so that we understand. Exactly. So the Secretary can review and make a decision on how that support will either be continued or adjusted. Mm -hmm. Very good. I would agree with that. I just would like to add something else sure. if I could. I, I do think that uh, all of us now, because of the unique environment that we're in, as we talked about extremism, 
I know we talked a lot about intelligence assessments and those types of things, and, and they're critical to this effort, really being able to predict. But I think we also need to anticipate and when we see large crowds gathering in the national capital region. They're all permitted by the park police, so we know when they're going to be here. We need to do a better job anticipating that kind of activity so that we think about the most likely and most dangerous uh, scenarios that we face. With that, we need to plan together, we need to train together, we need to exercise together, and we need to have an integrated security plan here for the NCR. As I mentioned in my opening statement about the number of law enforcement organizations that we have here in the NCR and the different jurisdictional responsibilities, we need to bring them together so we know how that we're going to operate in these, these complex environments that we're facing right now. Mm -hmm. And then we need to understand the critical capabilities that each of us can bring to that. And we need to make sure that we have prearranged agreements to provide those capabilities in a timely fashion. Mm -hmm. The challenge is when you start from zero and you're faced with the challenges that we were faced on the 6th collectively, that's a very difficult position to start from. So exactly. I think if we work at some of those things, I think we can be much more effective. And the Department of Defense really looks forward to working with people on that. Yes, and uh, I had a, a very good meeting with the head of the Joint Chiefs. He actually gave um, one of the highest civilian honors um, to um, um, one of our heroes here, and I was able to talk with him about this. And I think that this is a moment. I, I, I thought that, um, that Ms. Sandberg said it best when she said she's always learned and improved. And it's hard to do that in an environment like this, but, and I know it's not easy. Uh, have we asked, we ask these questions, especially when people think, well, yeah, okay, maybe we messed up this part of it, but how about those guys? Um, but we know there's things that can be done better. And so I really appreciate that. I don't know if the two of you want to add anything to my question. And that'll be it for me. <laughs> nothing to add, ma'am. Okay. No, Ms. Moza. Okay, very good. Well, once again, I'd like to uh, thank our witnesses uh, for, for joining us here today. Uh, this was a very long hearing. I appreciate uh, your perseverance uh, in dealing with uh, certainly a number of very uh, tough questions, and uh, we all appreciate uh, your answers. There's, there's no question uh, from what I've been hearing over these last two, two hearings is that there was serious breakdowns in our intelligence gathering and security planning that resulted in significant violence right here uh, on the Capitol grounds. The three-hour and 19-minute uh, delay in authorizing the deployment of the National Guard to respond to the Capitol to quell the violence was one that left police, uh, members of Congress, staff, and, and the public uh, in danger and is without question uh, completely unacceptable. The breakdown in communication in the chain of command within the Department of Defense that contributed to this delay a stark difference from the Department of Defense's response during the summer protest is concerning and should never, ever happen again. I remain concerned that our national security agencies are simply not adequately focused on domestic terrorism, which we all agree is the number one terrorist uh, threat to our homeland. The potential for violence uh, was well known and uh, widely disseminated all across social media platforms in the days leading up to January 6. Yet the very agencies responsible for monitoring and evaluating those threats failed to utilize every investigative tool to gather the readily available intelligence warnings of violence and have failed to assess this intelligence. The intelligence community's failure directly contributed to the law enforcement's inadequate pre preparation on January 6. And I understand the FBI and the DHS's commitment today to doing better in their intelligence collection and monitoring this threat, which I appreciate it. But we need to actually see these improvements. It has to be demonstrated in a meaningful way. It's not enough for agencies to simply promise to do better. Congress must make reforming our counterterrorism efforts a top priority. We need to take a hard look at reforming the DHS Office of Intelligence and Analysis and requiring both DHS and FBI to provide more concrete information to law enforcement so that they can take actions to protect our communities from this violent and deadly threat. Following today's hearing, I'll continue my investigation and will continue to interview other officials and experts as we work towards additional problems and potential solutions and I'm committed to working with my colleagues on both sides of the aisle 
across multiple committees to ensure that we are setting policy that will provide the foundation for our national security agencies threat uh, and treat domestic violence uh, threat with the seriousness that it certainly warrants and help protect Americans all across our country. So that, uh, I, mean, I close and uh, thank you again, uh, Chairman Klo uh, Chairwoman Klobuchar uh, for working with me on this hearing today. Well, thank you very much, uh, Chairman Peters. And I also thank um, our ranking members, Blunt and Portman. Uh, we have done every part of this hearing together and agreed on uh, witnesses and agreed on how we were going to proceed. We felt that was a very, very important. This is a political environment enough uh, without uh, politicizing this. And we have tried our best to be constructive. Um, uh, now we've had two hearings. And we all know there, we've had some consensus on um, many things. We've had consensus uh, from our witnesses that there is significant evidence that there was an element of this that was planned and coordinated uh, involving white supremacists and violent extremists people intent on doing damage, uh, not only just to this building, as we are reminded as we stood on the inaugural uh, stage with uh, now President Biden uh, with still spray paint at the bottom of the columns and um, still surrounded by what had just happened there only two weeks uh, before. Uh, they were intent not just on destroying the physical building uh, that we work in, but also our democracy that brought us to that moment. And as an aside, I really was proud of the work that Senator Blunt did in planning that inauguration, but also the work we did um, that night when at four in the morning, it was just the two of us and Vice President Pence uh, walking uh, with uh, two young pages that had the mahogany box with the remaining uh, ballots in it to go over to the House. People were doing their jobs just as you do your jobs. And so, uh, as I said earlier, I thought this was best summed up by uh, Ms. Sandberg when she talked about their after actions. Uh, when they look at, as I know I did when I was a prosecutor, um, sometimes with law enforcement, sometimes about cases, uh, sometimes about why a domestic violence case, I mean domestic violence as in the home, uh, got to the point that it did, and we would look back at decisions that had been made. Now, back then, we could do it in rooms just with ourselves. And that's a lot easier than this. And I'm sure you're doing that in your own agencies. But we have a public duty of oversight and a public duty to get this information out. And sometimes around this place, uh, the only way we can get the change and maybe the resources that uh, you need, um, Ms. Sandberg, that um, Director Ray was talking about, or the work uh, that you were talking about, um, uh, Mr. Soleil, Soleil, the, the man with the hardest name at this hearing, <laughs> uh, uh, Soleil, um, that you were talking about to be able to um, bring people together that we need to for the planning ahead of time so we get, don't get to that moment of chaos, uh, not only chaos at the Capitol, but chaos that, of course, uh, General Walker encountered when he was trying to get a decision that day. Um, and so a lot of this is stepping back, planning ahead, I personally think that it's been very difficult during the pandemic for people to meet uh, like uh, they used to meet uh, when they were planning ahead. And thankfully, with the recent announcements we've had, uh, we hope to be through that so people can um, once again be meeting face to face and across jurisdictions. I think that would make a difference. Um, as we look at the changes, which Chairman Peter so uh, well laid out, I think additional ones again, which I keep harping on, is that uh, the Capitol, the police board. Um, I just think having been in law enforcement myself, uh, this is just a recipe for disaster to have crisis decisions made uh, by a, a group of people on the scene or even leading up to it. Uh, I also think we know that um, as we learned after 9-11, as was uh, pointed out by some of our senators, that you can learn uh, from uh, horrible, horrific events and then do better with sharing intelligence that maybe old ways that people were getting used to with sending emails or maybe speaking up at a meeting. Maybe the right people weren't in that room. Or uh, perhaps uh, they're not looking at all the information because they're overloaded and you have to find a way to triage it so they actually realize something's important. Um, I personally think with everything that went on in the last year, there was some underestimation of the 
potential violence of these particular groups, which we now know all too well. And I also want to thank everyone involved in law enforcement, not just for keeping us safe that day, uh, but for the work that they are doing um, all across the country uh, to bring justice uh, to those um, like Officer Sickening, who lost his life, and those who were injured in terms of pursuing these cases, some of which are very straightforward because they put it on their own Facebook page, uh, but some of which are a lot harder to figure out what the coordination uh, is and what happened. So we all know there are still questions coming out of all of this. Again, some of them I'm sure very difficult because a lot of people were trying to do their jobs that day and mistakes were made. Um, but we do have to get to the bottom of some of this at the same time not losing track of our intent. There may be longer investigations that go on on all of this, uh, but our intent right now is to make sure that we make smart changes, getting the people in place at the Capitol. Uh, Senator Peters and I don't control that, but we can give our advice based on what we hear, and also making those structural changes uh, that can make it easier for you all to do your jobs uh, to keep this country safe and for us to do our jobs as well. So thank you very much. Um, and we will keep the record of this hearing open uh, for two weeks, and the hearing is adjourned. Thank you.